I think everyone has seen the images. We heard an amazing story, personal accounts this morning. It is uh, a phenomenon that's affecting the children of the world, the youth, the, the infants, the mothers, and those elderly. So it is an important and it's an urgent issue. Uh, you mentioned in your intervention that um, it's difficult to monitor. Um, Haze Gazer is basically, it's a crisis analysis and, and visualization tool where we're basically um, looking at various uh, different digital data sources that are available um, and monitoring that for, for um, coping strategies or for resilience. And, um, you know, when, when we talk about what, what citizens can contribute when it comes to monitoring haze, haze events, I think this is really, really important, particularly in a country like Indonesia, where there's such a prevalence of um, digital platforms and, and social media in the country, and, and people are very active users of social media. Um, so we're very happy to be able to, to analyze this data. Um, this is very... Um, we're very happy to be able to analyze this data and um, look at various um, data sources uh, that have become available, such as um, Twitter data. We've got um, impacts of, of fires through satellite imagery. Um, we've got citizen journalism videos. Um, through YouTube, we've got Instagram pictures. And what this is doing is um, analyzing it on one dashboard and feeding this information directly back to the government of Indonesia. Um, this platform has been installed in the president's office and they're actually using this to make decisions and, and for policy making. Um, so it's a really good way of capturing insights directly from people as to what's actually happening on the ground and relating that directly to the government so that they can make very quick interventions. Um, shall I leave it there? And Yes, thanks very much. I hope everyone is is on our online app. Sometimes it's nice to be a bit an anonymous. If you want to use, uh, do a bit of a, a provocative question, please uh, feel free. Uh, I also hope that you're using hashtag Peatlands Matter. Uh, I know that we had a bit of a da uh, a little bit of a blip of um, Wi-Fi coverage in the main area, but I think. If you want to share some of the quotes from our, our esteemed panel members here, please feel free to do that as we go. I want to turn over to, to Johan Kieft, my colleague here, and uh, ask a little bit more about how, how we can take the knowledge from early warning systems and better, get, better set it up so we can prevent and mitigate the health risks for people of Indonesia. Johan? The health sector has been more responsive, so people basically reporting you know, when they are sick at the health center, at the Puskismas or the hospital. <coughs> but there has been no steps to start reducing the risk people are exposed to, by, for example, through information, to taking steps, like, for example, installing, inst installing airtight rooms, or making rooms where children are sleeping airtight, or providing clean air, you know, like uh, clean air canisters for people who are like, who are like, uh, who are like exposed to pro in the fire fighting. The Masyarakat uh, the Api, those people are the forefront, and those people are basically are most exposed. And as such, I think we would like to argue that while we make this early warning available for these firefighters, in a sense, we would like to get the engagement of the health sector to also enable them probably in cooperation between the fire the faulty firefighters and the health centers to start taking steps to also reduce the risk of funeral crews uh, living in those fire funeral villages i think this is uh, that's why i think we have already developed the uh, frs the fire risk system which is available at kabakaranhutan.or.id since we can see what the upcoming fire predictions are for the coming season and I think the challenge we have now is, and that's also we are working now on, uh, with the UN, uh, UN Environment, uh, UNICEF, and uh, Global Pulse Lab, to bring in the health sector in the haze response. And I would like to argue, I think that's an important and important aspect, in particular to avoid, as Richard has pointed out, uh, as, uh, Richard has pointed out, the irreversible impact 
of haze pollution on the health of uh, particularly of, uh, of uh, children and young adults. I think, uh, Diana, I think uh, that's more or less uh, the key point. Yes, thank you for that. I read an article the other day that um, I'm Canadian, and so we have the luxury of having health care provided by our government as part of our taxation system. And I understand that Indonesia is working on that as well, a big commitment, hidden and preventable cost. As you have a health care system that's going to be uh, introduced and it's going to be heavily weighted with people in need for that health care, we need to work together to actually pull it back and take the preventative measures and, and educate people on how to protect themselves in order to also save the cost of that investment. It's quite uh, preventable to have to go to, to an emergency room, which is quite a costly affair when you're having an asthma attack but asthma attacks are real and they're dangerous. But uh, on that, um, with the healthcare system, with the investment of the government, uh, Sunny, we spoke a little bit earlier and you had mentioned that you wanted to link this fire risk information to fiscal policies and looking at allocating money to the provinces, districts, the municipalities. Shifting this emphasis to uh, from from the fire suppression to fire prevention, uh, what exactly motivates that for you? Tell us a little about 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 your work as well as answering that question, please. Uh, th thank you, Diana. I'm, I'm Sonny Mumbunan. I work at the the University of Indonesia Research Center for Climate Change. There, I, I coordinate uh, work on, on fiscal analysis, uh, in particular fiscal transfers. Uh, by training, I'm an environmental economist, so this is the area that we, 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 we are analyzing. Uh, before going into that particular questions, uh, uh, Johannes mentioned about the, the, the fire risk system. This is uh, already there. Is uh, uh, we, we, we work together to sort of uh, use the information provided by the system to, to say better plan and, 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 and you know, uh, design more appropriate uh, fiscal instruments to uh, local and subnational governments. The, the system itself is, is, is interesting, the fire risk system, because the nature of the information, Johan touches already a bit, using uh, advances in, in climate uh, science. Uh, but I think the, the, the data and information that it provides, you know, there are three at the moment, the fire vulnerability, hotspot pr uh, prediction, and fire risk prediction. We believe we can use this kind of information into uh, allocating uh, financial resources to different level of governments. But I think one distinct feature of, of FRS is the, the temporal scale. Uh, we have seen, or we, I think we, we noticed that some of the innovations are using very short time uh, predictions, uh, so the, the, the now cast, so to say, uh, rather than forecasting. And the FRS provides three up to six month uh, lead time. So we have like six months uh, time to predict, but then the vulnerability maps it produced can also be extended up to a year. So this kind of information uh, that we need and are relevant of planning. If you don't mind, I would like to, okay, it's there already. So the, the, the longer the, the, the time that we have to anticipate or predict fires, then there is a possibility to design uh, more fire prevention than fire suppression and that's relates to your question you know i think at the moment the, the status sort of uh, i also discussed with nico a bit about you know more spending uh, no more fun have been spent on on suppression this is cost, costly and uh, if we can shift that into prevention measures then uh, we can save uh, not only health uh, 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 
expenditure uh, related expenditures but also general uh, you know resources for, for other development purposes and uh, one of the conditions to shift uh, from suppression to prevention is by using risk-based information and that is enabled through the the, the system uh, and by doing so, we, we, we might be able to respond and plan budget more in, in a sustained way rather than, you know, ad hoc as, you know, the, 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 so to say, the, the, the status at the moment. That's the practices that we are doing. We are uh, very reactive into uh, fire uh, outbreaks, but I think in the future we need to, to sort of uh, looking more into the pre prevention. Now, how this relates to, say, healthcare? I think there have been some innovations, advances, but it seems to be like compartmentalized. They don't communicate each, each other. The, the, the whole point, or I think one, 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 one motivation of, of you know, building this kind of information, so forest fire uh, translating into fiscal mechanism, institutionalizing it, uh, I think this has the potential to bring different development issues using the, the, the fiscal mechanism and budgeting, budgetary mechanisms into uh, the way we organize our limited resources and, and spend it. So I think this one one of the possibility that we, are, uh, uh, we, can, we can try. At the moment it is still, uh, we are in the exploratory phase. Uh, there is already a report. Uh, then we will try with tests at selected, uh, I think, district and provinces to see the potentials and limits and, you know, uh, regulatory uh, uh, context and, and, and uh, technological applications. So I, I think I will leave uh, that. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much. We're then going to shift to another a slide there, uh, but what I, how do we recognize those signs? How do we shift from, you know, seeing the smoke, seeing the fire, to recognizing what are the signs and symptoms as people in the most affected areas are the ones that are going to be, um, you know, alerting, we hope, if we, if we, raise the you know the, the reach and, and spread the reach to get citizens involved um, but in order to get citizens involved they really need to understand the issue and relate everyone is relating to it because we're living in it but what makes fire on a peatland so special Nico can you speak to that and how does it differ from other wildfires Uh, thank you, Diana. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Nico Wister, and uh, I arrived here from South Africa. But working on fire uh, that I represent works on uh, five different continents right now on very much the same issues that we're discussing here. Um, the term in terms of response is integrated fire management. But what does all of that mean? How is that integrated? But back to your question. Um, why is fire on peatland so special? In fact, the answer is it's, it's not special. Fire is a science. Fire is the same everywhere. What is special in this case is that if it's on peatland and you fail to respond to it correctly, it leads to a disaster and the impacts that my colleagues have discussed from health environment through. So it's special in that respect, but the fire itself is actually not special. And the way that you deal with that fire is also not special. And I'll explain to you a little bit why. Um, fire on peatland, any fire, has two basic phases. Well, three phases, if you will. It starts with an ignition, small, and from there it grows exponentially. Um, so on peatland, you just have a shorter time frame within which to deal with it. Any fire on peatland starts on the surface, except if somebody's really devious to go dig somewhere. But it all starts on the surface, and surface tactics dealing with fire is the same everywhere in the world. It's the same here as well, and that's your window. 
So practically speaking, what is the window to deal with it on the surface before it becomes a subsurface fire is maybe the practical question. Um, so 90, if 90% 90 of the tactics to deal with that fire is the same, then what does that mean? It's, it means detecting it quickly, which means don't have haze so that you can see, which means you start detecting with the first fire of the season. Secondly, it means that you have the systems, capacity and people in place in the right places linked to the risk system um, who can respond very quickly to that. Now, I would venture, it may differ depending on peatland's uh, moisture content at the time. Peatland combusts at, ignites at about 55% moisture, which is high. We're not used to that. It makes all of your responses to that more critical. So you would say detect and respond to a fire within 15 minutes. If that fire is in commercial or palm plantations, um, those trees start falling over in an hour from having burnt. Some of our forestry colleagues will tell us that. Um, so you have detected and respond in 15 minutes. You have 45 minutes to deal with it. If you're outside of that time frame, you have a bigger problem. You now have fires that start to go subsurface that you need to deal with differently. Very expensive, very difficult. That's why I say, actually, it's not special. It's the same thing because 90% of your reaction should be the same as everywhere else. And, and what that means is that um, in, in, in terms of, for instance, the haze buildup, much has been made about the haze buildup. You know that old saying um, when you're at school, uh, where there's smoke, there's fire? It's about the fire, it's not about the haze, I think. If we can eliminate the fire through proper tactics, um, then we, we're able to eliminate the haze. And, and that's, that's also very practical for us as people who deal with fire. We want to be able to deal with it early on because it keeps clean air so you can deal with, you can see more the next fires. So think of this as a chain. If the first fire in the season is dealt with immediately, it doesn't build up haze. And the second and the third and the fourth. Now you have no haze. Or let's say less, let's be practical. Because you can't be everywhere at once. Um, so in, in, uh, we deal with fire, as you may see on, on the, the integrated fire management wheel there, in four phases. Reduction, which is reducing and preventing fires from, happen, from happening. And that needs to happen at a community level. It needs to involve communities. The more rural, the more inaccessible your area is, um, this is not maybe Canada where the, it's easier to get to some of those areas. Uh, other areas, no way north is another story, yes. <laughs> Some areas where, yes, where it's inaccessible, it means you need to place reliance on the local community to do two things. And I think this is missing in the Indonesian environment, we haven't gotten there, is firstly to prevent them from starting fires. But how do you prevent them from starting it? It's all these alternative livelihoods, um, alternative agriculture that we've discussed. Um, and secondly, you make them part of the fire response solution. That hasn't happened in Indonesia. Imagine a situation where every village on peatland, and we know there's about 1,500, 1,700 of them, has a small firefighting team, six of them. What do those guys do throughout the year? The time that they're not fighting fires, they are dealing with their community. They are the ambassadors for sending the message of not having fires. And you know what? Every indigenous community across the world is the same. There's a person in that village who knows who started every fire. I will put money on it. Not too much. Um, so they become part of the solution. They are the initial attack. In firefighting, we call that initial attack. And then you, have a, you need an extended attack capability when things happen, as they say, things happen, um, when you need more capability, and that probably on a district or a sub-district level. That's been worked on a little bit in Indonesia, but not on the community side. So if you reduce the fires, you get to your readiness, the second um, orange part, um, where you have the systems and the people and the capacity in place to respond quickly. 
uh, then your response, uh, which is the, the red part, should only be 20%. Right now, the response in Indonesia is 80%, 20% readiness and reduction. It should be the other way around. It's exactly like Sunny also said. When that paradigm shifts, the entire picture shifts. And, and that's actually not difficult if we get back to basics on this. Um, may, maybe that's just a start. The recovery, rehabilitation, research, as Johan said, there's a lot of that already. It's a question of bringing that into the system and bringing it all together. So integrated fire management, if practiced in, in this way, and there are lots of models that can be used, I think the, the disaster situation was so overwhelming, uh, knee-jerk reactions to things, sending planes in uh, without ground support. By the way, in fire suppression, um, an aircraft that is not followed up by people on the ground immediately is a waste of money. Aircraft also always have to work with people on the ground. So making these systems gel together, being ready for that, is, is the key, and I think that's where the discussion should start. Okay, thanks for that. I want to go back um, to Derval and ask you about how we know about uh, local communities, the critical role that they have to play in alerting us is is Hayes Gazer developed? You mentioned that the president used it. Um, probably not on a s smartphone. I don't know. Is it an app yet? Has it been developed as an app yet? And also, how real time is the data and information uh, available there? And finally, how can people, what sort of signs would they need to use? Um, to trigger their alerts and give them the confidence uh, to refine their their communications into. I know it's a, it's an iterative process. You know, we might see uh, something coming up and an alert, but we don't want the, cry, the the crying wolf syndrome. So, how do we get communities to believe in it and to have confidence in pressing that that button? What should be they be looking for? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'm not sure if the president is using it, but the president's office is, is certainly using it. So um, it is installed in the president's office. Um, Hayes Gazer was first developed as um, a closed um, platform for government decision making. But actually, what we realized is that more and more citizens, we, we really want to feed back this information to citizens so that they can um, act on it themselves. So hazegazer.org is now an open platform that everyone can access and, and have a look at. Um, and there's various different data sets there on, on we'll say, application and also the, um, what you're seeing um, in the open version. But essentially what you have is um, you've got what we call active data and passive data, actively collective data and passively collected data. Um, active being um, people when they're act actively reporting. So if they're, if they're posting um, comments on, on news fora, if they're posting complaints onto the LAPOR, the National Government Systems uh, Complaints website, um, there is an active um, complaint system in, in uh, Indonesia. So that data is collected and, and aggregated and um, analyzed and put on, on Haze Gazer. Um, but then you've, uh, you contrast that with um, passively collective data. So where people are just using um, Twitter, for example, or any kind of open um, social media sources where they're just complaining, you know, you're having a really crap day. You've gone to the hospital because your child has asthma or a respiratory illness and, you know, you can't actually get seen in the local Puskes mass because it's full. Um, and, you know, so this is all really, really interesting data. It's been fed, analy analyzed and fed back to, to government for decision making. And I think that's um, the real beauty of this is that it's empowering um, the government, you know, and it's giving them very, very rich insights into what's actually happening in a real time basis. Um, I think this is cutting in and out, so apologies, but um, it's, it's giving the government um, 
near real-time information and so that they can act on it um, more efficiently and also then communities can act on their own data now that it's open and it's been fed back to them. No, I think uh, like for the uh, FRS system as well, I think we're looking, it is publicly available, but we have to make it, turn it into an app form so it's easier. Loading up a website on your cell phone can be a bit uh, risky. But it's linked to an SMS system where villagers in selected, in selected areas are getting, are getting warnings by SMS in particular as well. And ideally, now we're looking at now in, in, collabor in collaboration with the government as well to look at the system of having this, this small trained uh, you know, earlier tech uh, brigades down there, having them better positioned and being more active. Because I think it's important as well, I think that's also where Hayes case you come in, that we can also track the effectiveness of, this, of the response. Because as Nico has explained, the early response is critical. If we get a 90% success rate, or we set a KPI, yeah, let's talk a bit in uh, organizational language, uh, of 90% success rate of these early tech e e efforts, then we don't have a haze problem. The problem is, as soon as, as Nico said, as soon as fires submerge, it becomes very difficult and very expensive to put them out. And I think as well, I think that this is a policy decision, that, that's also something where haze case can help it as well, because ultimately, if he's successful there, we in the need, need less money for firefighting and can use that money for other purposes, like better education, better health, uh, better health support, and you know all, all these other nice things government tends to do, instead of buying, uh, you know, buying uh, water bombers and uh, yeah, and helicopters and you know, like, and, and putting lots of money in, in in fire prevention. Now, in addition, of course, the significant uh, environmental impacts of haze, and thus the significant environmental co-benefit of being able to get uh, to, to get rid of fires at an early stage. And I think I think I think that is a bit the uh, the, the over bottom line. And as I said before, it is important and particularly I think Palankaraya has shown that that the uh, the health impacts are significant and that citizen action in a sense where to the government to insist on better health protection and better protection is important. That's why it's important that the health sector becomes an integrated element of the uh, of the uh, the fire and haze response. Yes, thank you. I I think it's the concept of looking at the investment of Indonesia in, in the restoration work that they're doing um, and seeing the opportunity that's there. It's a rich, wealthy country and the opportunity to shift those resources uh, really would be quite remarkable. But on the health level, on the the health factor, what do we know really about the scale of impacts, Richard? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> there have been a number of studies that have been conducted internationally and uh, nationally, uh, looking at uh, the impacts of haze on uh, on human health. Um, I think um, you could probably look at these stu these studies in in, in, in two um, as as two types modeled estimates that are looking at uh, mortality and morbidity, um, which basically uh, the most advanced of these modeled estimates are basically using satellite data and uh, linking that with um, uh, information on f from cohort studies on like long-term studies on the impact of air pollution on human health and then using that as a formula to calculate uh, an estimate of the health impact. Um, these are considered fairly sound forms of um, calculating impact, the scale of impact, um, although they can be further improved as they are estimates only. Um, then there are also um, studies that look at measured effects of um, uh, um, the health impacts of air pollution. So these methods are basically, um, I guess what you'd say, traditional epidemiological studies where you're going out to the field, collecting data from local puskesmas or from uh, hospitals, vital, vital statistics, and uh, linking that with maybe uh, fixed air pollution monitoring devices. 
that's just a way of looking at two. There's studies that are trying to link these as well, um, and linking that information is quite critical. Um, the scale uh, varies from the number declared um, as um, dead from um, death from asphyxia, which um, my understanding of the ICD codes, in, which is the death classification codes in this country, I, I think there's no specific classification for respiratory related death. Yeah, so that makes it a little bit complicated. Um, but then, like I said before, if you're looking at modeled estimates, you can look at this dose-response relationship between um, the, um, the effect of air pollution on human health over, uh, over a period of time, and then overlay, overlay that with population data and give yourself um, uh, an estimate. Um, I think you can look at these studies and find out the results of those. But I think a few points to note are that the estimates are good, but you could probably improve on, say, looking at cohorts in country. So they have like this family life, uh, what's it called, the family, um, it's a longitudinal study on family um, surveys, and you can use that dose-response relationship. And I think, um, I think in Indonesia we could probably um, work on um, integrating those um, cohorts into estimates, as well as um, considering for, specifically for children, how some of these cohorts are looking at that dose-response relationship for people over 25 years old. But we don't have cohorts that are looking at children from a very young age, so we have to find ways to, to, to rectify that. Um, but um, I think also what's, what we have in Indonesia is there's a lot of data on, on peatland fires and the emissions factors that are coming out uh, from the actual peatland fires, which differ from, say, a usual forest fire. So it's important to find ways that you can integrate that into these calculations, these estimates. Um, I, think, um, I think, aside from looking at the actual estimate of mortality and morbidity, death and long-term disease, I think what's also worthwhile considering is, as my colleagues have mentioned, looking at forecasting fires, you want to also forecast um, the implications of land use decisions on, on health, um, health outcomes. So look at if, uh, what, what, what would um, the decision to, um, for, to clear a certain plot of land, what would, what would that translate to in terms of um, human, life, human life lost? or costs to the health system. And not just direct costs, but then all the indirect costs of long-term um, disability to the, to the population. Um, I might leave it at that. Thank you. That's great, thanks. You mentioned the masks that people are using are not effective or uh, as useful as they could be. Johan also mentioned about the importance of getting information out to the most vulnerable uh, groups about sealing off rooms for those that have respiratory illness or sensitivities. This is, and we then we also talk about the firefighters, this is a massive operation and a sort of network. But I do think that you know, these sort of conversations, as well as the conversations we're having here today, connecting the discussion on, on peat with health, with people, and with the choices they make. So, Sonny, our, our money, money guy, if I were going to invest in something to protect immediately myself from, from haze, would what would the investment be for the person, either a mask or the protected cover, and then pull that up to the, to the national level? Where are those points of immediate impact, investment impact, that the government and uh, private sector and businesses can get behind? Sunny. I think as well, I think that's very important to look at that. So it's partly personal protection. It's also in a case 
if he can predict that he have a major high alt impact when, and we uh, try our best effort to control fires, but if for one reason or another still things go out of control, also in some cases decisions might have to make to move and temporarily evacuate communities. That's that thing that's something to, to think of, particularly specific vulnerable groups. As well as start investing in protective rooms and spaces within villages where people are protected from exposure to haze as well. And there is something else to think of in terms of health impacts of peat fires. That is the problem with peat fires is that ultimately you burn through your peat. The problem is what's under the peat. And in many cases, particularly in the coastal peat, that is PRE, that's acid sulfate so soils. And the problem with these soils, if they oxidize, it's that they release uh, uh, iron oxides and aluminium into the environment. And this creates a whole new set of additional health risks. I think that's something for consideration. I think that makes the action the government is taking, is taking now to protect peatlands actually the more urgent, despite the impact it might have on you know, certain economic activities, particularly uh, pearl wood and maybe palm oil production. Ultimately, the long-term impact, positive impact it is, is on the health, through less haze exposure, and through uh, mitigating the risk of, uh, uh, of uh, complete disappearance of peat and exposure then to the impacts of, you know, like an, 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 an acid sulfur uh, degraded environment, I think are significant. And from that perspective, I think, Ultimately, restoration of peat is, in the, from that perspective, is critical and is critical for Indonesia within this context to meet its sustainable development uh, goals. And Sunny, the sector, the 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 decision for the person, where do they put their immediate few resources? The individual. Thank you. This is a difficult, very tricky question, but I think the whole idea that we would like to bring here is that uh, when it comes to public finance, there are different responsibility assigned to different level of governments. And along with that assignments, it, it, there are also different agencies and ministries involved. Because we are not uh, saying that, uh, you know, like tech, uh, preventing fires involve only one uh, directorate or only one ministries. There will be different ways of, of, of dealing with prevention. But I think the, the making the linkage between fire risk and fiscal allocations may increase or enhance the efficiency of, say, targeting. We know uh, specific geographic with higher uh, likelihood uh, of fire risk. And uh, you know, we, with enough time, there's been, we, we have in this concert, uh, conversation the, the very critical time. We have enough time uh, for anticipation that reduce a lot uh, of the of the uh, of the cost. So, if you ask me very specific, and that will be depending a lot on 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 which areas we are discussing, and the resource system, uh, you know, peatland or mineral land. Uh, 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 um, under discussions, but I think I'll uh, like to, to raise, and it has cost implication. Is you know the study of the World Bank, 16 uh, billion uh, cost. Of course, it, it hasn't included the, the long-term impact of, of health, and this is about two percent of our GDP. But if we compare with say the value created by say large palm oil plantations, it's, it's like twice. You know the cost. Uh, of fires is twice the value of all large plantation produce. And what does it mean? It means that we sort of like back, you know, with our development, uh, uh, we, 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 we incur loss, then we gain. Uh, that, that's pretty obvious. What is not obvious is how, I uh, like the, 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 the way that uh, uh, Richard put it, how to translate these into planning, into budgeting. It seems like different silos, compartment, you know? We are speaking of sustainable development, we are uh, spending twice money and like, like gaining only one out of it. And this need to communicate, this need to be connected. 
and uh, we are exp I think this provide again provides a possibility of bringing again and when that is happening then we can discuss later on which areas and what type of investment and it might be changing from uh, year to year so that's the And I guess it's about uh, keeping busy and sort of on your path and maybe not looking to your right or your left or, you know, delving so deeply into your area of expertise that, that the passion overwhelms you and can actually put blinders on. But I think when we talk to, to people uh, that are affected at the communities, they have a much more holistic perspective of the problem. And uh, I wanted to, to ask you, Nico, aside from the fires directly, how um, would the integrated fire management solution and uh, up applied on peatland areas, how would it impact the rural economy in your, in your opinion? I think that links uh, very well with what Sunny has said and I can see this problem and it's not a unique problem in Indonesia where you have funds available in silos, you're spending uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars on healthcare effects of this and in effect what you need to do is transfer that back to, the, to address the root cause um, and that's a, a policy or a political problem. So. To, to answer your question of what kind of impact this would have economically, let's let's ask ourselves what would a, what would a system and, and let's focus just on the peatlands for now. In Indonesia, you have uh, what we call 14 fire-prone peat districts. That's where 80% of the haze comes from. Uh, what's the figure? 80, 85% of the haze from from those 14 districts so if it's it's very simple to now extrapolate that uh, remote and inaccessible as some of those areas are um, you sit there with 190 sub districts you sit with about a thousand five hundred thousand seven hundred villages so one can cost these things out it's relatively easy um, on that same area you sit with roughly two million hectares of forestry plantations and the name of the game in integrated fire management is collaboration. Collaboration between all actors in that space. That's when you gain efficiency, that's when you save costs, then that's when you have the biggest socioeconomic impact. I'm, I'm coming back to your question. So if, if, if that solution needs to lie there, the, the problem is that that collaboration is not having a nice dinner and a chat, which is not even happening in Indonesia between the different actors. It needs to be institutionalized uh, collaboration. And there are ways to do this. There are ways that, that this can be done. Typically, we call those fire protection associations, where things are done on a, on a district or a sub-district level formally, formal collaboration. This is how we pull resources. This is what we do. But if you pull that through to be, to be a little bit more blunt, if we have a $16 billion impact overall on the economy of the fires in 2015, and this type of a system only on peat, which will address 80% of the problem, would roughly cost under $200 million a year to implement a full proper system. It becomes a no-brainer to do that, yet it's not happening because of the silos. And, and that's, that's where it comes. But there's another element that I don't know if that question has been asked in Indonesia, and I'm using specifically a South African example here. The Working on Fire program started in South Africa to address two problems. Fires and the effect of fires on people's livelihood and on the economy, the $16 billion question. Uh, and also on people's livelihoods, uh, how, do they, how does the fires affect them? But also, how can that the money that is spent to deal with fires uh, contribute to job creation, contribute to the local economy? Now, we know from some of the ILO's work and some of the work that was done in South Africa, repeated in other areas, in looking at the moment at Brazil and Chile, that roughly half of, if, if it costs $200 million to do this, 
Roughly half of that is spent just on wages of local people in villages. That's not even the other that, that, that comes in from the outside, from the, from the larger macroeconomy of the country. So the socioeconomic impact of the solution is much bigger than only eliminating the problem. It actually can be turned into an opportunity. And I think those figures sort of speak for themselves. They're not final figures, they are desktop type of approaches. We're looking at a macro level. And if you can do that at that rate on 80% of the problem, which is on peatlands, it's very easy to replicate in the, in the rest of the country the same model. That one's coming right back to you because I've got a few uh, questions here. <laughs> so uh, I've got two questions which I'd like to group together. They're related and they're both likely for you, Derval. Um, this one evidently. Does Hayes, Gaver, uh, Hayes Gazer um, take into account regional variances in access to technology and social media? And can we be sure that areas with technology aren't prefer preferentially tended to? And how can citizen science be better harnessed for better monitoring and management of peat fires? Okay, so on the f first question, which I've kind of forgotten there. Yeah, I'm gonna put it on the screen. Oh, excellent, okay. So which oh yeah, the regional. Um, regional yeah. So we're mining data from um, various different uh, data sources. It's not perfect. We never say that big data is the answer for everything. What we say is that it's a complement to existing data. What we're doing is we're overlaying it with official data that we're collecting from government sources. Um, so we do have kind of baseline data on which we're overlaying satellite imagery, social media, etc. Is it um, truly representative? No. Um, but it is, and we have um, judged that in areas, and, and Nico mentioned the 14 various districts where most of the haze is coming from, there is a lot of social media um, signals coming from those areas. So we do feel that there's enough, what we're calling smoke signals, um, on which to give a good perception of what's happening at the moment. Um, so there's enough um, citizen journalism, there's enough um, people reporting on problems that you can actually say to the government, this is an early warning indicator for you of something that's going on in a particular region. We're not giving a solution, we're giving an indication of what's actually happening on the ground, and we're, we're saying to the government, go and investigate further. And the most popular question on Slido is, there has been little haze since the 2015 crisis. Is this by luck, due to weather, or design, due to the effectiveness of government and other agencies? Three, uh, th this, this is the popular one, who's gonna take it? Okay, here you go, Johan. I think it's a combination of things. One, eh. Uh, but the thing is, yeah, the last two years have been, uh, 2016 was La Nina, 2017, where we are now moderate La Nina moving to which we El Nino, which has created up till now, like about every train for patrons. So I think that is one big uh, factor. Another thing is the government has really picked up in terms of joint patrolling, where there's, so villagers, village government, the TNI, police, uh, is patrolling together, and that has been fairly effective in, uh, in particularly in the sense it's bringing in this early early detection moment uh, close to the fillets, and that has really started working, and that has paid off in reduced in 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 in, 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 in the reduced fire occurrence. Uh, I think, and in addition, I think there is also amongst communities, there is I've, as far as I've seen, I've been working on this effectively since 2000. There is more awareness now of the risk of wildfires. And communities are putting in more effort to control fires better than they did 10, 15 years ago. Okay, thank you very much. 
um, Richard, what kind of first aid tool actually if, is effective to reduce carcinogenic particles entering the lungs, especially for children? And this is going to be coupled with a question, what kind of changes or infrastructure would be necessary to provide people with myoreliable masks for severe haze events? Two-part question. We're still working on getting that up there for the screen, but you can look at the phone if you need to. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry, we've got the, the technology here. Okay. Thank you, that's all right. I think I can answer them. Um, from, from my understanding um, of the, the toxicity of, of haze um, smoke, air pollution, um, Basically, uh, even your N95 mask that you could probably get is not going to be sufficient at the peak of haze. Yeah, I think um, maybe uh, there was a colleague that was sitting here who was telling me the story of when they were going out to do field visits and taking measurements of emissions factors at the height of the haze. He was telling me how he was wearing, for his own precaution, the whole team decided to wear full um, full, uh, fully intense resp respira uh, respirators. They're basically um, the thing that you'd fit around your face and you have to strap it on with the... the yeah, this is... Um, those are the ones you see in all those movies, right? With the double breathers. Yeah, just picture yourself being a fireman. Yeah? Yes. Um, that's... If we're talking about peak um, emissions, that that's that's the only thing that's going to really protect you sufficiently and that's not going to be uh, something that uh, you could expect a child to wear day in day out um, I think if we're talking about like low cost but um, at least minimum standards right now what would be probably best to see and I'm probably not the authority to speak on this, but this is just from what uh, we, we've been led to um, with some of our research lately and discussions and planning with s some partners is that at least move to N95 masks as a minimum. They're available in your local hardware stores just as you know something that you can buy and pro possibly afford if you're living in a rural remote community, you don't have a whole lot of money. Um, something that um, local Puskes masks could, could supply with their own budget. Um, but um, these masks, they're not currently designed for children, yeah? Um, so aside from that, from the, the trip, say, from a child's home to their school on a daily basis, if they have some form of protection, that's one thing. When they get to their school, bricks and mortar, what's, what's the building like? Is the, are there holes in the walls? Is, is the window open to air? Because otherwise the pollution's coming in. Um, you know, I'm, I recall personally just uh, sitting in a disaster risk management conference in India last year at uh, 300 threshold, uh, which was um, the, basically the, um, the hazardous threshold of WHO standards. Um, to note that during the peak of haze, it was uh, 10 times that. Um, visibility, I could struggle to see 20 meters ahead of me. Um, and basically in that environment, you know, there's um, there's no one wearing masks in that environment, and this is you know it's a, it's a general concern. So, and this is this is um, the air that's coming into the room that we were having having our general conference. So, on a side, I digress, but basically saying, okay, if you're in this haze environment um, in Indonesia where peatland fires are are, are going off. Um, you'd need to be looking at, um, as Johan mentioned, somehow looking at air infiltration and ventilation of buildings, um, looking at how you can rig up low cost, but um, uh, simple and um, simple air purification devices. So we're, we're, we're talking with partners on this, on how, how we can work to um, design some simple solutions like this. Um, they have them out in the market, but um, 
there's nothing on the, the market here right now that we've seen. Um, and uh, th these are the sorts of solutions that I think, okay, that's, if you had this in your room, you could at least reduce the um, particulate matter in the air to a level that's uh, below the hazardous level um, and at least control that environment, somehow seal the windows. Um, but look, you're talking about children and children want to go out and play, they want to have fun. And a lot of our community level studies, a lot of what our community level studies have indicated is that children don't, although they're irritated and, they're, and, and um, they feel the effects of the haze, uh, they just want to go out and play. And um, you can't, it's sometimes very difficult to keep someone inside contained uh, for extended periods when we're talking two to three months a year. This is, this is quite serious. So I think aside from those like risk reduction measures, you've got to also be looking at air quality monitoring, um, so low, co low cost sensors, so that people can track and monitor when they're approaching a threshold in, in air quality, um, and then also have the flexibility to make decisions about when schools should be dismissed and um, um, whether that you should be changing school schedules to accommodate for peak um, air quality um, air quality issues. Um, and um, generally speaking, I think um, that uh, authorities need to be communicating to the public um, what are the standard operating procedures in that sort of uh, situation. Every child obviously has the right to play, should be out playing, should be ed educated, should be going to school every child. So Nico from Davis, is alternative livelihoods enough as a way of dealing with fire starting? Let's look at stopping the fire t starting instead of resolving it, the haze. I think the direct answer is no. It, it can't be enough, uh, but it is part of the solution. Um, the land use change and the drivers of land use change in Indonesia as a whole on a developmental level, on a macro planning level, have to be addressed at some point. Um, and I think we've seen moves in that direction. But uh, providing alternative livelihoods for people and alternative ways to, to grow crops, uh, polluting culture, um, alternative crops in terms of uh, what is more fire resilient, is part of the solution, um, but it, it can't be the whole solution. Thanks, everyone. I think we want to go to the room. Uh, we got quite a good level of interaction on, on the um, online. And apologies for those of you that have had any technical difficulties trying to get online. You can use hashtag matter as well to post those uh, questions and comments. And many of us are on Twitter, so we will take our time during the day or tomorrow or in the weeks to come to reply to those messages and, and keep up with the interaction. So is there anyone that would like to ask a question in the room here? Yes. Do I have another? So the microphone, if you just stand up. Microphone. Okay. Let's save time. I'm coming on over. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am Asep Akbar from South Kalimantan, uh, Banjarbaru uh, Environment and Forestry Research Development Institute under PODA and I am a researcher. I would like to give the uh, input, yeah. uh, talking about uh, uh, fire, fire characteristic in, uh, in Fitland. Uh, actually, is uh, technically uh, uh, fire in fire speed in in Fitland is uh, s slower uh, than in the 
uh, mineral soil ya yeah, in the pit from forest but uh, is uh, more difficult to extinguish because uh, when uh, uh, fire occurs is uh, must be two types of the fire is uh, going on like a surface fire and pit fire so, so uh, the for initial attack and uh, fire extinguishing technique is uh, not only water uh, can uh, extinguish the fire also uh, ad additional matter like uh, foam and it must be uh, used yeah is technically and uh, uh, according to our research is uh, 200 250 uh, meter square per minute in uh, mineral soil is fire speed but in 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 pitland pit fire is only 50 uh, meter square uh, per minute so I, I think it, uh, is is lower uh, but uh, uh, the other problem is uh, availability of uh, water yes so uh, but uh, currently is uh, there is the new technology that's uh, uh, making the deep well uh, is about uh, 20 25 meter depths is is a uh, good technology for uh, supply the the stock of the water you you can uh, use every time uh, uh, water always uh, available uh, because at first uh, according to uh, uh, my uh, experience yeah, yeah, uh, every time we soap the suppress the fire is always uh, using the fire from small canal and dig well and the problem is uh, continuation of the water is is not good but no it's not problem for uh, uh, stock of the water and and uh, according to my opinion for fire prevention is uh, depend on of uh, uh, three is uh, first a is education education is always training and give the transfer technology for local people in the vicinity of the forest is uh, is one and uh, the other is uh, law enforcement for for arson is as uh, something like this must be this law enforcement and and the third is uh, discipline uh, uh, how to mix the plantation with uh, low risk uh, of fire like when the dry season is must be minimize the fuel under the plantation of the is very important if there is three aspect uh, uh, we we applied. I think a uh, big fire is not come. As you correctly said, there needs to be that balance: the the the, the education, the awareness, the training and technology, the law enforcement, and the fuel load management, which is an important part. Uh, and there are a few others as well, but that's a, a long discussion. Communities are all over the same. It's all human nature. If you if you focus only on the law enforcement, and I'm, I thank you for for raising that, um, you actually create with, through legislation you create a criminalizing effect in communities. If you make them part of the solution, you'll find that your law enforcement need reduces because they become part of the solution. They are part of the problem, and they have to be part of the solution. The same applies to any land user. If the correct environment is created, so those guys will make sure that there's less fires. They know who the people are. So in effect, you're changing, you're decriminalizing this because they are dealing with it themselves. And this is a very important social, uh, social, and it becomes a political issue. If 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 fires are seen and prevention of fires is seen as a, a political imperative. Um, then, then communities respond to that. But if you make that switch, communities respond very positively to that. I think that's the only addition I'd like to add on that. Thanks very much. We have another question here. 
Thank you for your question. My name is Ahmad. I'm a student from Bogori Culture University. I have three questions to all of the panelists here, um, especially as youth. Um, perhaps all of youth here uh, really ignorance to peatland matters or forest fire and so on. And for instance, me because I'm not Bogor, I have I don't have a, you know background about the peatland and so on, with fire and then halt and so on. So I guess this is not my business. And then what do you want from youth if you want to? Uh, engage us to get actively to tackle the forest uh, peatland fires, especially the effects and so on. And then the second question is about uh, the technology. As we know that most of the youth uh, and also indigenous and so women are, man are marginalized, especially in the local area, who affect uh, who who are affected by the like uh, peatland fires effect and so on. And then how? Do how how can how can they get the actual data or update data to what is it to understand which is the health the, the health is better and so on after they now we just discover or yeah they suffer with uh for the haze and then another toxicity material impurities for um, for a spit land fires and then the third question is about um, cross border of youths. No, we, 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 we know we just the forest fire and the peatland fire is not only sovereign Indonesian people and then Indonesian citizens, but also Malaysia and also Singapore. Do all, all, all of your, uh, I mean, do your institution consider or envisage, which is all of the children are safe in Singapore and also Malaysia, not only just in Indonesia. Do you consider or envisage the healthcare and so on? Thank you. Can I respond to the second question while I have the mic and while you have time to think? Um, yes. The women and youth marginalization, actually the South African model uh, that we implemented paid, had, had a particular emphasis on that. And we're proud that the Working on Fire program in South Africa has the highest proportion of women uh, in the world. 30% of the, f the active firefighters are actually women and it only employs youth. Granted, it defines youth a little bit higher than we used to, but it, it, it focuses specifically on that. And, and there's a reason for that, because youth enter into the society. It's the best way to influence, must be involved. We're living longer and, and staying younger. <laughs> so youth can be a little bit older, why not? Yeah, I was just going to say, yes, we do take into consideration um, surrounding countries. Hayes Gazer is actually monitoring those two countries as well and feeding back with different data sources what we have available in, the, in, in those two countries also. Um, when it comes to um, technology and what youth can do, um, I think you've got a responsibility of, of reporting, um, of feeding this information into the government, and I would actively encourage all youth to, to feed back this information to the government of actually what's going on around you, because I do think that the government um, does listen. It takes, it takes a while sometimes, but it does listen, and I think the more information they get, the more they can be empowered to act. Sunny? Uh, I'd like to respond to the, the um, availability of data. I think, uh, and in part, this is also relevant to the discussion of using social media. Uh, not all youth or, or, or society in general in, in rural area use uh, social media. And uh, uh, given that, that condition, I think we need to have a system that have longer lead time, and this is what the FRS is offering. And uh, the, the challenge, the next challenge will be how to, you know, sort of package this information to be something that local communities, rural youth, or, or even those with, uh, you know, difficulties in reading uh, can, can appreciate that information. There are some protocols being developed for uh, Everest that uh, I, I saw, but I, I think the, uh, in addition to that, I think we, we need to, you know, in, in villages, that there are like annual uh, uh, process of having the village development documents. And when, when Pete, forest fires is already in the, in the discussion of planning, uh, informed by, by uh, forest trees, and I think, discussion will be a bit different. So they, 
develop the, the capacity to anticipate much or at least uh, a sufficient time uh, in advance. I'm going to take one more question. I'm a bit of a rule breaker and I've just negotiated five more minutes. We might not be live for all that time, but let's keep talking. Uh, baik, selamat sore. Saya tidak pakai bahasa Indonesia karena uh, tidak bahasa Inggris, tidak bisa karena saya dari masyarakat biasa. Nama saya Setiono dari Siak Provinsi Riau. Uh, setiap hari yaitu masyarakat peduli api atau berhadapan dengan hutan dan berada dengan api langsung. Ini sangat menarik. Ini uh, pas di tempat saya. Saya diundang ini pas uh, di sini tempat acara saya. Uh, sangat menarik yang sudah disampaikan oleh moderator depan semuanya, penilis semuanya. Uh, saya uh, langsung, uh, mungkin kalau Bapak yang tadi cuma uh, belum berhadapan langsung dengan api. Kalau saya sudah sekian tahun berhadapan dengan api. Saya lagi masyarakat bukan dari segi pemerintahan, bukan dari perusahaan, tapi dari masyarakat peduli lingkungan. Yang masyarakat peduli api yang tanpa digaji. Uh, kami uh, punya forum masyarakat peduli api yang beranggota 25 orang. Uh, ini sangat menarik, ada beberapa hal yang kami sampaikan. Uh, kami mohon yang selama ini keluhan dari kami, dari desa sendiri, karena tempat saya itu lahan gambut, saya lebih kurang 14.800 hektar, 600 cuma lahan liat, sisanya gambut. Jadi itu yang kami jaga. Uh, yang kami harapkan sekali, uh, kami mohon, memang dari Badan Rosi Gambut, uh, BRG, ada beberapa titik memasang alat deteksi panas, ataupun memasang alat uh, untuk hotspot. Uh, kemungkinan itu kurang, Uh, kurang dari yang sekarang ini. Uh, sekarang kita sudah memasuki musim musim panas, bulan 5 sudah musim panas, tapi kita tidak bisa menduluin di atas dulu. Tapi sekarang sudah kategori kalau di Siak Riau itu sudah memasuki musim panas. Uh, kami kekurangan, kekurangan dari uh, data ataupun informasi yang jelas kepada kami, karena kami punya posko sendiri, padahal masyarakat peduli api sendiri yang punya yang garda terdepan, bukan dari yang pemerintah. Karena kalau terjadi kebakaran pertama, itu dari masyarakat peduli api sendiri yang mematikan dulu. Karena dari masyarakat inilah dari api kecil bisa matikan. Kalau sudah besar baru minta bantuan pada pemerintah. Jadi kami mohon kemungkinan eh, memasang titik-titik yang tertentu untuk kami ketahui. Ketahui bahwa hotspot itu ataupun ada titik api yang panas. Karena jangkauan kami luas. Kalau di Sia aja itu mungkin belum ada titik untuk pasangan dari e, melihat kondisi hotspot atau panas. Jadi kami kurang tahu. Kami informasi tahunya dari kalau dari e, dari Sia itu menggalak menggala agni atau dari kepolisian. Itu pun lambat, lambat karena api sudah besar. Maksud kami itu ada satu e, kami sudah punya pos pemadam kebakaran, tapi kami tidak punya alat itu. Tapi kalau kami punya alat sendiri, mungkin dari kang kawan atau dari bapak yang hadir depan mungkin bisa memberi kami lebih kami cepat tangani mungkin itu aja terima kasih selamat sore thank you I met a few of those firefighters in the field uh, yesterday and actually we'll be tweeting about them tomorrow I'll head over here to uh, Johan which uh, who will just give a quick summary because um, he can translate and respond okay so once. any um Bapa, uh, saya uh, tadi saya kurang dengan nama ya. This microphone's better, Johan. Uh, Bapa Sutiyo, nanti dari Siak. Nah, kebetulan dua hari lalu kami di Siak, kita ketemu dengan Pak Wakil Bupati, dengan Pem dan lain sebagainya, lihat desa dosa dan darah nak sakti. Uh, terus ini yang Bapa cerita itu punya kaitan dengan informasi dan juga Pak kainnya latihan yang ada sehingga Bapak bisa mengarahkan cepatnya ke api dan bisa mem memadamkan api secepat mungkin dengan cara apa. <coughs> nah kebetulan kepanikau dari uh, ya, uh, kurang uh, dari Afrika Selatan itu apa belum bisa bahasa Indonesia itu karena kami membawa itu berapa setengah tahun lalu uh, berapa orang dari Indonesia untuk belajar di Afrika Selatan di sana mereka ada itu alat deteksi dengan kamera yang memungkinkan memang untuk secara cepat deteksi api di mana diinformasikan ke MPA, ke pemimpin uh, MPA supaya bisa bergerak dengan kota cepat dan memadamkan api saat masih kecil. Berarti sebetulnya itu bisa dan itu bahwa satu hal yang itu kami harap bisa diuji coba di Indonesia secara lebih luas 
Aan je scaring was je de circuit is je dingen technologie. Dat bij paradasen je zo de bieza. Ze lijn niet toe. Denk aan het systeem FRS. Ik doe biasa kan ik keren. In die op een bepaalde manier SMS. Ik mag een gala acne. Dan ik BNPB. Dan berapa itu biasa lembak pemerintah printer lain. Tapi ini barangkali kita juga harus berpikir dengan masyarakat di bawah bagaimana kita bisa menjentu ke, ke masyarakat bawah. Supaya barangkali harus lewat app dan supaya bapak bisa langsung dapat pesan singkat. Pakai, oh hari ini apa jadi rentang kebakaran dari risiko kita harus siap siaga jalan sudah. Oke? Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to say thank you on behalf of this distinguished panel that has spoken honestly, openly, and passionately about this issue. We have a lot of passion in the room and online as well. We're going to keep it going with hashtag Peatlands Matter. Follow us on uh, Twitter or Facebook or any other social media that you may choose. And please, there's nothing more important than speaking face to face. So we will be available, accessible, and excited to speak with you more about this at the Pete meet and greet this evening. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>